Okay. Hello, everybody. My name is Richard Rapport. I'm Emeritus Professor of Neurosurgery at the University of Washington in Seattle. <clears throat> and today we're going to talk about head injuries, a subject with which I have an enormous background because Harborview Medical Center, the only level one trauma hospital in five states, is where I attended. Uh, the Whammy region, which is made up of Washington, Alaska, Montana, Wyoming, and Idaho, uh, uh, has only the Harborview as the level one center. So everything from all of those sparsely uh, populated states comes to us. I've seen lots of head injuries. Next, please. Am I controlling this or are you? Ah, there. Okay. So we're going to talk about traumatic brain injury, which I have subtitled Blood, Lead, and Beers, which is a lesser known quote of Sir Winston Churchill. Next. Next. Keep going. We're going to start off with Dr. Rapport's five laws. First law, never get on a ladder after the age of 60. I assure you that the chances of your falling off are great, particularly if you're doing something like this or this. <clears throat> Next. In addition, 78,000 ladders sold at these big stores were faulty and recalled due to fall hazards. So the world is out to get you. Next. Dr. Rapport's famous second law. Next. Don't text while moving. Everybody in Seattle violates my second law. Next. Third law. Next. Don't drive, skateboard, dive, or argue with people after drinking Bud or Pabst Blue Ribbon. Next. <clears throat> it's not possible to drink one of these. You have to drink the whole six pack. Next. And then you do this. Nice. Next. Fourth law, don't hang out in the Walmart parking lot after 10. Nothing good happens in the Walmart parking, parking lot after 10 at night. Next. Fifth law, and this is the most important one. Next. If you are afflicted with a male child between the ages of 14 and 23, lock him in his room and let him out when he finally reaches the age of 23. The Y chromosome is an evolutionary disadvantage until that age. Any of you with a small male child will agree with that, I think. Next. This is all they got. They're working with a brainstem. Next. <clears throat> I'm not the only one who thought this up. William Shakespeare said the same when he wrote, I would that there were no age between the between 16 and 23, or that youth would sleep out the rest, for is, there is nothing in between but getting wenches with child and wronging the ancient tree. Shakespeare knew about this several hundred years ago. Next. This is central herniation, a concept that you're probably all familiar with, but unlikely to have seen. Uh, this is the tonsil down, slammed down through the uh, frame and magnum, and it causes pressure on the brainstem. It doesn't take very long for this to happen before, like all hernias, this begins to swell up and push on your stem, and then you die. Next. And this is what the MRI of such a problem looks like. The only thing that is living in this brain is the middle cerebellar peduncle. All of the rest of it is dead. Next. Next. <clears throat> Transtentorial or uncle herniation is probably more familiar to you. That's when you, one has a mass in the temporal lobe. It pushes the... Uh, temporal lobe across the uh, tentorium. And what's there is important stuff. The peduncle, 
the uh, uh, third nerve and the posterior cerebral artery. So when you push against those things, several things happen. Next. Uh, first, this is the posterior cerebral artery that's been pushed against long enough to produce an infarct. You can also see there's pressure on the cerebellum, uh, uh, on the uh, peduncle. Next. Sometimes it happens on both sides, and then you get cortical blindness if the patient survives, which is unlikely. Next. There's a, a violation of these laws, which is known as the Kernahan's notch phenomenon. So you see in this image, the uh, uh, temporal lobe is swollen up on the left, but instead of pushing against the stem, at this level, it pushes the entire stem against the tentorium on the other side. So the damage is to this part of the brain. And what's gonna happen then is the wrong toe is gonna go up. So if you ever see somebody with a left-sided injury and their left toe is going up, you will say very wisely, aha, Kernahan's notch. This is pretty rare these days. Next. And this is just what it looks like on MR. Uh, here's the distribution of the posterior cerebral, and here's all this dead brain uh, in the stem. Next. So you can see if you look closely that this is the same thing, the same Kernahan's I've been talking about. Here's the injured temporal lobe. It's pushing the whole stem over, and this is pushed against the tentorium on the other side, and that is infarcted. So that's going to produce the wrong toe going up. It's going to produce the left toe going up. Next. When I started operating on people before CT scans, this is what we had. This doesn't tell you very much about the brain. It's uh, a cracked open skull in every uh, dimension. But honestly, we didn't know very much about the brain in those days. Next. So this is a Lafort II, uh, the whole skull's been fractured. But again, we had to infer from uh, ex examination mostly uh, what was the matter with the brain. Now we do a lot better. Next. So this is an acute epidural hematoma on CT scan. They are always lens-shaped, lens-shaped. This is an arterial bleed, but the re resistance from the uh, dura is great enough to just allow this much bleeding, and then it stops usually. Next. Next. They're not always arterial. This is a venous uh, epidural hematoma because it, uh, uh, big veins bleed a lot. It happens along the superior sagittal sinus, and it happens here in the posterior fossa. Next. This is a child that I took care of years ago who was taken to a very good children's hospital. She was five uh, in uh, Tacoma. And because she was five, they didn't want to CT her until she stopped breathing. <clears throat> this is a gigantic acute epidural hematoma. Next. There's a good uh, algorithm for how to decide when to get a CT image of a child called PCARN. And uh, if any of you have kids in your practice, it's a good thing to have in your back pocket. It tells you when it's worth it to get a CT scan on a kid. Next. So by the time that baby got to us, this was what the MR looked like in the temporal lobe on the injured side. Next. And this is what the rest of the brain looked like. And of course that baby died. Next. We don't always see uh, such dramatic stuff. Sometimes it looks a little less horrible. There can be uh, contusions, traumatic contusions and little blood clots. The trouble is that these sometimes tend to get bigger and there's already an epidural here. So sometimes you have to do more than one CT. Next. And sometimes you have to do what around Harborview Hospital we call pop in the top, 
So our treatment for these things these days, when the uh, periclot swelling gets to be too great, and here you see it in the gyrus rectus on both sides, which is also very common, we take off bone and we leave it off until the swelling subsides. This is a common practice. Next, please. Sometimes they're bilateral. Bilateral is bad. You can see how much crowding around the stem there is here. Next. And sometimes the diffusions are, con are diffuse and the whole brain gets swollen up. Again, it's common to see it in the gyrus rectus because that's just sitting on a flat plate of very lumpy bone above your uh, olfactory nerves. Next, please. One of the solutions to, su to swelling for neurosurgeons is to give people lots of salt. But sometimes there's a downside to, have if the, to that if the brain is leaking. So here is a kid I also took care of years ago. There's a left frontal contusion with a little bit of swelling around a lot of blood. Next. And that's what it looked like about three hours later. When all of that salt leaked out through damaged capillaries, into the substance of the brain itself. And when the salt leaked out, the water followed. This kid was uh, just graduated from high school. He was about to go to New York to go to uh, music school. And he did eventually after we put all the bone back on. Next. Now this is an interesting CT. Uh, this CT doesn't look so terrible except if you look for the cisterns around the stem and you don't see them. When you see a picture like this on CT, the, inter the intracranial pressure is 40. And you got to do something about that right now. Next. Uh, you may have heard the term bolt uh, being put into people in uh, neurosurgical ICUs. And what the bolt does is give you an easy way, the doctors and the nurses, an easy way of following the pressure. And uh, one of the attendings here, Randy Chestnut, who's very big in the brain trauma world, wanted to know whether this, uh, the use of bolts affected outcome. And they published this big randomized trial. Next. And they found actually that it didn't, do much to uh, influence the outcome, but it did make taking care of the patients much easier. And now we're gonna switch to PEDS. This is a ping pong ball fracture. These used to be very common and they were uh, often elevated. Um, but unless there's bleeding around or some sort of evidence of cortical injury, the growth of the child's brain is going to push this out better than a surgeon can do it. So now we leave them alone. Next. Another thing that can happen uh, as a corollary of these kinds of injuries is CSF leak. We used to also operate on all of these. You can see here at the base of the front, there's a hole. And we used to open all of these up and fix them directly. Now we got much smarter and we just put in a lumbar drain, let them drain for a couple of days and they seal up themselves. So if you can avoid an operation, do it. That is avoid it. Next. I've included this, although it's not really trauma, it behaves like trauma. This, If you see a picture like this, this is always a hypertensive intercerebral hemorrhage from the perforating blood vessels. And these people get really sick and they get sick in a hurry. Um, next, we often take bone off for that too. In this case, we took it out. We don't do that so much anymore. We usually just take off the bone and let the blood and swelling subside. <clears throat> next. Uh, when I was operating on people, we used to take them out through a burr hole. Now there's this minimally invasive Apollo system, which is very fancy has uh, has uh, the ability to find where you are with this probe. Uh, they cost thousands and thousands of dollars to do what we used to be able to do through a burr hole, but now you have to do it this way. Next, it does a pretty good job. Here it was to begin with, 
And here it is after Apollo got done with it. So it's simpler. The outcomes are about the same. Next. They don't always happen in a supertentorial space. They can happen in the posterior fossa. The closer you are to the hole in the bottom, the faster you're going to herniate. So when you see a clot like this, also it has to be treated in a hurry. Next. Anybody got any idea what this might be? Aside from a clot in the brain? It's a, got a typical appearance. What it is is uh, an infarct that has bled into itself. So if you're making around some morning and somebody somebody had a stroke and they're a lot worse, this is probably what happened. It's not terribly common when it does happen. People also get sick very quickly. You got to take it out. Next. Next, please. So this is an acute hemispheral subdural. Subdurals, as all of you know, if you've been taking care of people for very long, are very, very common. In my world, they were really, really common. <laughs> and the reason they occur is because as you age, the brain gets smaller, the vessels, uh, the veins over the cortical surface get stretched, you rattle your head around, and one of them bleeds, and you get an acute subdural. Next, please. And what we do is take them out. And so this brain looks relatively normal. The midline is where it's supposed to be. And uh, you can see the surgeon's tracks over the cortical hemisphere here. Next. They don't always occur over the cortical surface. Sometimes they occur in the midline where you'll remember from neuroanatomy when you were in medical school, there's lots of veins flopping around here and they are easily torn. So this is such a difficult place to get to. We usually don't operate on these until they get really big. Next. So I call this a hematocrit of the brain. This was an acute subdural that didn't get taken out, which is reasonable for the reasons I've told you. <clears throat> but it began to dissolve. And then there was another injury and more blood came into this chronic subdural now. And that layers out because the red cells are heavy. So it's a hematocrit of the brain and a big one. Lots of shift. This ventricle is supposed to be over here. Next. Yeah, um, we took that out and the patient did fine. Next. This is a mixed uh, density subdural. So the blood, as I've said, breaks down, breaks, doesn't break down all at once. It breaks down slowly. Here you have a very, very uh, swollen brain hemisphere compared to the other side where you can still see the cortical architecture. This is so big, it squashed the brain down and removed the cortical architecture. Next, please. This is a subacute subdural. And the reason I show this is because the density, the ROI number on the CT scan of the clot is identical to the density of brain. And if the person reading your CT scans is used to reading body CTs or something else, and this density is exactly the same and filling up this whole space, they're going to miss it. And I've seen that happen a time or two. <clears throat> Just that's something to be aware of is all. Next, please. So this is a relatively small subdural. That's about a centimeter of subdural, but look at the shift. The whole ventricular system is pushed way over to the left side. Why is that? Next, please. Because of the loss of tight junctions of the small capillary blood vessels in the region. And these, when they lose their tight junctions, they start to leak water uh, into the brain itself. And the whole thing swells up. And again, that's a emergent situation. Small subdurals don't necessarily mean that the brain isn't really being mashed. 
Next. This is a little different problem. Um, this fellow uh, was told by his girlfriend that she was leaving him. And unhappily, he was in possession of a nail gun. And so he decided that he would shoot himself in the head with the nail gun, which he did very effectively. Next. And that thing went right through his peduncle uh, to the other side. I'm not sure how he missed the arteries, but he did. Next. And this is a subtraction uh, MR angiogram showing that he also managed to miss the uh, basilar artery. So he actually didn't kill himself somehow. Next. This is another poor decision. This guy didn't have a nail gun, but he did have a crossbow. And again, his girlfriend announced she was leaving and he shot himself under the chin. The top of this came out, the top of the arrow came out the top of his head. Next. Uh, go back, go back one if you can. <clears throat> Yeah, so we took this out by doing a little craniotomy around the top here, chopping off the arrow here, and then pulling it out from under his chin. And this guy actually, believe it or not, was completely neurologically intact. He missed everything, went right along the falks. <laughs> Next, please. Uh, this guy... Uh, had both a wife and a girlfriend. There's a certain common thread here, which you probably picked up by now. Um, and uh, the girlfriend annoyed him, so he shot her with a shotgun, then he felt bad and shot himself. Next, please. He wasn't a very good shot, and only a few of the pellets got in to his brain, but the ones that got in did manage to get into Broca's area, and so he was mute, and because he couldn't talk, he was never sent to jail. Couldn't prosecute him. Next. Uh, this is a bigger slug. It's a 45. I know that because I put the uh, measuring stick on it and measured it. It's 45 millimeters. He shot himself. He was despondent. Next. He shot himself down, down the hemisphere. You can shoot yourself down the hemisphere and only uh, not and, and probably not die uh, because you're only uh, damaging half your brain. Um, this guy did survive. Next, please. If you're serious about killing yourself, you need a transventricular gunshot wound. So that's what this is. Transventricular gunshot wounds are fatal. Um, Here's the wound of entry. I know that because the fragments are going in. Next. And here they're coming out. So this is the wound of exit. Uh, this goes through the ventricles. And of course, it isn't going through the ventricles that kills you. What kills you is going through both thalami. You got to have at least one thalamus to be alive. So this guy died too. Next, please. Sometimes... Funny things happen when you shoot yourself in the head. This is the wound of entry. Again, here are the fragments. Next, please. Here's the bullet. And here's the bullet in the center of the white matter. So what happened? Did the guy reload and shoot himself twice? No. Bullets bounce if they hit at the right angle. Can you go back one again, please? hit at the right angle here, right at the top of the uh, base of the skull, it'll bounce. And if it bounces, next please, if it bounces correctly, it can wind up in a funny place. This guy died too. Next, please. So this is published about almost 10 years ago now. What happens when a person's shot in the head 70% of people with gunshots to the head die in the field. 
die where they fall. 90% eventually die. Nearly all survivors are gravely disabled. This is an amazing statistic. This again was published 10 years ago. Half of the related annual deaths from the approximately 50,000 TBIs a year in the US are related to small arms injuries. I think that number is greater now. I can tell you that uh, years and years ago when I was chief resident at Harborview, for the year there were two gunshot wounds to the head, two. One self-inflicted and one guy shot by the police trying to flee. This is an amazing statistic. Horrible, horrible, horrible. Next, please. Well, lastly, I'm going to talk to you about not an actual injury, but anoxic encephalopathy, which is sort of a related kind of a thing and is also pretty common. This was a little girl who was properly uh, restrained in her car seat in the back of her mother's car when she had an accident. The fireman couldn't get her out for about five or six minutes and her brain died because of lack of oxygen. So all of this is dead brain. Dead brain, dead brain, dead brain, dead brain, dead baby. Next, please. Now, this is what DAI looks like uh, now on MR, which is the way that it's imaged. So it likes the corpus callosum. Uh, here's DAI, here's DAI. Next, please. Uh, here's DAI, this is on T2 weighted. Again, it follows the corpus callosum. Next, please. You don't see it on CT. Uh, even I didn't see this on CT scan. Next. Uh, but you can see it on diffusion restriction MR. Next. Here it is. This is a kid who was driving home from his second job some Somebody ran into him, went through a stoplight going 80 miles an hour, hit him. Dead brain, next please. Dead brain. This is the worst case of it I've ever seen. Next. Dead brain, next. So now on MR, we use what's called SWE, susceptibility weighted imaging to see uh, to see this DAI. So this is a CT scan. This is a T2 weighted MR, and you don't see much of anything on either one of these, but all of these little black dots are dead brain. And DAI is funny. Uh, sometimes it can look terrible and people can survive it, but not often. I think that's it. Is there another slide? Oh, so this is uh, chronic traumatic encephalopathy. I forgot about this. Um, there are two centers studying CTE, one in Seattle and one in Boston. Uh, the one in Seattle is looking at MR. The one in Boston is looking at uh, autopsy brains. So um, on uh, uh, tensor imaging, this is what CTE looks like. Um, CTE is a real thing. It's a bad problem. And these, you know, I, I played football in college actually, and <clears throat> I, I was a running back at about 180 pounds. Now the punter weighs 180 pounds and the linemen weigh 350 pounds and the running backs weigh 250. And those guys running into each other are going to produce a lot of problems for themselves down the road, down the road. Okay. I think that's it. That's the last slide, yes, doctor. Okay. So if I can get back on screen here somehow, you can get rid of the rest of it. Put me back. Uh, hello, everybody. Are there any questions? I'll take that as a no. I hope that uh, I was able to teach you something. And if not, I beg your forgiveness. Good luck. Go forth and heal the sick. Thank you, Jennifer. Thank you so much, Dr. Rapport. I did put 
the survey in link in the chat for everyone, just a reminder um, for you to complete that at your earliest convenience. It'll also be emailed to you as well. So thank you so much. Really appreciate um, you doing this presentation for us, Dr. Rapport. Always my pleasure. Thanks a lot. Bye. Thank you, Jonathan.